Welcome to this episode of Unraveling Adoption, an intentional space to delve into adoption's complexities together. I'm Beth Syverson, an adoptive mom of a vibrant and insightful 19-year-old son, Joey, who is struggling to find his path. I'm walking beside him while working on my own personal growth and healing. We are committed to helping anyone touched by adoption, and we want to help the general public understand adoption's complexities better too. Today's guest is Peter O'Brien, a late discovery Australian adoptee who found out he was adopted in his mid fifties. He's a retired accountant and his passion has always been genealogy, even before he knew he was adopted. He will tell us about his own awakening to adoption in the last 10 years or so, and about how he helps other adoptees. So welcome to Unraveling Adoption, Peter, and hello from across the world. <laughs> Good morning and hello from Sydney. Yes, I think we're 17 hours apart, so it's pretty amazing that we can, A, find a time that we're both able to talk at the same time <laughs> with our time change, and just the technology is amazing that we can talk to each other from across the world. So, well, you have an amazing story. It's a rather unusual story, but I wonder if we could just start at the beginning like we usually do. I just want to hear what your basic childhood was like. Was adoption even on your radar at all? I grew up in a family with one sister who was slightly younger than me. We were in fairly modest circumstances, but I had a great childhood, great parents. And actually, I knew a little bit about adoption because I have a cousin who had an adopted child. Okay. And so there was another example in our family. Okay. But in terms of myself, uh, never had the slightest idea, not the slightest inkling. Uh, when we were kids, my sister used to joke that she thought she was adopted because she felt that in some cases I got slightly better treatment than her and that oh. she was adopted. But she's not. She's biological, right? She's biological. That's so, so but, funny. But that, never the slightest hint that I could have been. Or that's very just, ironic. Yeah, as it turned out, yes. Yeah, and it's often the adoptee that feels less than than the biological child. So in your case, it was kind of flipped on its head. Well, in hindsight, I wonder whether my parents overcompensated. I bet. Yeah, they might have overcompensated or it might just be the second born always feels. Or well, boy, girl. Thing too. Yeah, boy, I girl. More, yeah, for sure. I had more freedom than she did or less restrictions. So it could have sure. been that as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Fascinating. So you were pretty close to your sister growing up, though? Oh, yeah, we, we were close. We still are close. We're very close. Uh -huh. And you loved your family. And I assume everyone kind of looked like each other. Or otherwise, it would have been obvious that something was not quite well, matching. Well, yeah, I don't look astoundingly different, but we all look like each other. And I had great family. I've got great extended family, uh -huh. lots of cousins and uncles and aunts. And yeah. we spent a lot of time with family members when we were kids. Nice. In hindsight, I just can't believe Nobody ever said anything over all the years. So before we get to how you found out you were adopted, how many people knew you were adopted? As it turns out, the only person who did not know was my sister. Okay. You and your sister were the only ones that didn't know. So all the cousins, aunts, uncles, everyone, the neighbors, teachers? Uh, yes, I'm pretty sure neighbors knew. I'm not sure about teachers because okay. too many years later and I don't know yeah. any of them now. So I'm not sure about teachers, but certainly everybody in the family except my sister and probably neighbors. Wow. 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 You know, I've talked to several late discovery adoptees, 20s, 30s, 40s. You found out in your late, mid 50s. Whew. I just can't even imagine what kind of earthquake would happen when you find that out. And I want to find that out from you. But how did you find out you were adopted? Well, my mother, who was in her 80s at the time, got dementia and had to go into a nursing home. So my sister and I hunted around and found a nursing home for her and got her into a nursing home and got her settled in the nursing home. And then, as I know now, one day... My sister was visiting her and had a casual conversation with one of the staff in the nursing home. Mm -hmm. And that person said to my sister something about her adopted brother. Huh. And my sister said, oh, you've confused me with someone else. I've only got one brother and he's not adopted. Uh -huh. And the staff member said, well, I think you better go and talk to your mother because she's talked extensively to people in the nursing home about the son she adopted. Whoa. And so my sister had a conversation with my mother and tried to get her in a lucid moment uh -huh. and managed to do that. And so she confronted my mother 
And my mother said, yes, that's right. And he's really smart. He'll work it out. Oh, well. <laughs> and so, oh, man. My sister agonized for a week or two because she didn't know whether I knew and just uh -huh. had never said anything. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a question, huh? Yeah, so she sat on it for a while because she thought maybe I did know and had just never said anything. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Or maybe I didn't know and maybe she should just keep quiet. But anyway, eventually she came to grips with it and decided she should tell me. So she sent me a text message one morning and said, I need to talk to you face to face. Nobody's dead. That was nice of her. So went, <laughs> yeah, well, well, remember our mother's in her 80s. And yeah, right. Know, so. Yeah, when you get your uh, phone calls from relatives at certain times of day or whatever, you're like, huh. Hmm. So anyway, I went around to see her and she told me and we burst into tears mm -hmm. and that's how I found out. Wow. Now, at the time, you were in their mid-50s. Were you pretty stable, like, emotionally? Oh, yeah, with but, your yeah, been married for 30 years and got a daughter who's okay. self-sufficient. And Yeah, so yeah. You know, I was stable. Yeah. And then what did that realization do to you? What happened in the immediate aftermath of that? Well, I was shocked. I literally couldn't believe it. I bet. Um, because I'd never had the slightest inkling. Mm. And my mother had a really good friend who is still a really good friend, or she's passed away now, but at the time was still a really good friend who we were still in contact with. And so my sister and I rang her that morning and spoke to her and said, is this true? Uh -huh. And she said, yes, yes, it's true. I had many conversations with your mother about uh -huh. it, and I told her many times she should uh -huh. tell you. Oh, really? Wow. And, and I think at one stage, I think my mother may have even told her that she did tell me to get her off her back. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, I bet adoptive parents, sometimes I bet, especially maybe back then, they say, I'll tell him when he's ready. I'll tell him someday. I'll tell him later. <laughs> and then later never well, comes, and then your son is in their mid-50s. <laughs> well, uh. in Australia at the time, there was this thing called the clean break theory. Okay. And they used to tell adoptive parents that they should just take the kids yeah. home and then forget it ever happened and yep. just get on with life. Yeah, we call that the blank slate over here. Yeah, yeah clean okay, break, well, heard same thing. Clean break. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, just like, oh, nobody will notice. Just act as if they're yours and they are and it's all good and nobody will be the wiser. So she was doing what they said. And, and my mother was a very authoritative figure within her family. Mm. And she told everyone that she was never going to tell me and nobody was ever supposed to tell me either. Oh, wow. So everybody had to keep a secret. They did a good job of keeping a secret, I have well, to say. <laughs> they were all told they had to keep a secret and they did. Oh, my gosh. Oh, well, my goodness. Very, my mother was held in very high regard oh, in her family. She, they were going to cross her. No, no. Some people even refer to her as a saint. Oh, wow. Okay. So she was like the matriarch of the whole community, it sounds like. Yeah. She was held in very high regard yeah. by all the rest of her family. So wow. they did as they were told. Yes. My grandmother kind of sounds like something like your mother and they would not go against whatever she said. I can imagine that happening. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. So did you feel betrayed? Or were you angry or relieved? Or I have very conflicting emotions because I was angry that they hadn't ever told me because I had never had the chance to find out or make any connections with biological yeah. family. But I was also conflicted by the fact that I had great parents, great childhood, great yeah. everything. I, mean, yeah. I was never any doubt how much they loved me or sure. how much they cared for me. Mm -hmm. And so I was, well, I to some extent, I still am really conflicted by the fact that I'm angry with them because they never gave me the chance to get to know any of my biological family. So you did go searching and were many of them already gone? The next morning, I made contact with some people to find the, with the post-adoption resource centre in, oh, yeah. in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. And they helped me go through the process and I was able to locate and contact my birth mother. Wow. In one day? In Australia, you have to apply for some information. Okay. And it took a few weeks to actually get the information in the mail, and they give you some basic information. Okay. And I got that information late on a Friday, as a matter of fact. And because I'd had 10 years experience in genealogical yeah. research, uh -huh. within two hours of getting that basic information, I had her name, address, 
phone number. I knew where she lived. Oh and gosh. as it turns out, I had a cousin who was traveling in the countryside at the time uh-huh. and I spoke to them and she actually drove past her house the next day and took photos of the oh house. Oh my gosh. You feel like a spy, I bet. Like, Oh well, yeah, they got rousted by the neighbors because somebody came out and asked them who they were and what they were doing. Oh, <laughs> so, oh my God. And I used the post adoption resource center as an intermediary uh, and they actually wrote her a letter on my behalf. Okay. Asking whether she was indeed my mother and whether she would like to have contact. Okay. And did you end up meeting her? Uh, yeah, after that, she was receptive to that. Apparently, she and her family had a family meeting. Okay, okay. And talked about it, and she was receptive. So I sent her a letter that I had written myself. It was sent through the intermediary. Okay. And then eventually, we had a meeting. I met with her, two sisters and a brother, and I took my wife and daughter and my sister with me. So we all met for lunch Aww, one day. I bet that was lovely. It was a bit traumatic. Was it? Okay. So tell me what all went on, how that landed for you. No, no, that was good, but a bit traumatic. And there were really too many people. It sounds Um, like a lot. Bear in mind, at the time, I thought maybe this was going to be my one chance. Mm. And I wanted my daughter to meet her grandmother. Because you weren't sure if she was going to want to continue to have a relationship with you or... No, we didn't really know. This might have been a one-off because she was very quiet and I think she was somewhat overwhelmed by the whole thing. Yeah, I bet. How old was she at that time? She must have been in her 70s then. In in her 70s. Yeah. She would have been in her early 70s and not in robust health. Mm, Okay. She was a bit overwhelmed by the whole thing. And In hindsight, there were too many people, but it was really the only way he could go yeah. in those circumstances. Yeah. So so did you continue a relationship with her? Yes, we stayed in touch with each other. She lives in a small country town in New South Wales. It's a few hours drive from where I live. Mm-hmm. And I went to see her several times. We spoke on the phone regularly. She was delighted that I'd found her. Oh, that's so nice. And she said the only reason she didn't look for me was that she was worried that If she went looking for me and I'd had a bad outcome, she wouldn't have been able to cope with the whole thing. With the guilt. Okay. So did she tell you the circumstance around your adoption? She made it a condition of our meeting that I not talk to her at all about who my father was. Oh. And she wouldn't talk about him at all, wouldn't discuss him. Mm. She told me a little bit of the circumstances in that when she was pregnant, her mother more than anyone was adamant that I had to be adopted and that okay. she couldn't keep me. Uh, she was 18 and unmarried okay. in a small country town. And so I'm led to believe that it was her mother more than anyone yeah. who was kind of the driving force behind the whole thing. And yeah. her mother involved the Catholic priest in the town Ooh. and she was sent to Sydney to a Catholic home for unmarried mothers in okay. Sydney. Okay. And that's where she and had so, you. Okay. That's where she had me. I've since discovered more of the circumstances around the whole thing. Oh, okay. But she gave you that part of the story, but said, if you want to see me, you have to never, ever ask about your birth father. Ugh. That's correct. How did that feel for you? Was that a price you were willing to pay, obviously, because you went and met her? Well, I mean, I hate to sound duplicitous, but I was happy to say that to her at the time. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you're like, oh, she'll change her mind. <laughs> Well, on the basis that she may or could change her mind or that I would go about finding him in another way. Anyway, yeah. Okay. But I was happy not to have that discussion with her, certainly initially. Yeah, and most adoptees, I think, are more gravitated toward their birth mom anyway. That's who you have the real connection with. So that makes sense. But that kind of stinks, though, that she just put a big wall up there. That uh... She had very strong negative feelings about my birth father. Uh, 55 years later. Just anger toward him. Yeah. Oh. She carried that for a long time. Wow. That's a lot to carry around over all those years. Oh, poor thing. Did you find your birth father? Did you find the rest of the story? Well, my birth mother eventually got dementia too. Oh, wow. And so before I could really press the issue with her, she also had dementia. Mm. And she passed away about a year after we met. And as a matter of fact, both of my mothers died within a month of each other. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. That was that, that was very that difficult. Was pretty, wow. That was pretty difficult. Wow. So I was always determined to find out as much as I could about my father. So mm-hmm. I did a DNA test. 
Okay. After she was gone, you did a DNA. After she was gone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did a DNA test, and really, I knew less than nothing about DNA. Okay. I did a DNA test with an American company called Family Tree DNA. Okay. And I got my results, and it was like a foreign language to me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't make head nor tail of it, but I had only one reasonable DNA match, mm -hmm. but not close. Okay. And so I spent 12 months doing all the things I could, making contact with people, okay. trying to learn about DNA, okay. trying to figure it out. And after 12 months, I'd got basically nowhere. Wow. And around about that time, Ancestry started offering oh, DNA okay. tests in Australia. Okay. Uh -huh. And so I did another DNA test with Ancestry. Okay. And in that test, I got some slightly better results. And then over the next three or four months, I got new DNA matches that were also more helpful. Because oh, Australians now are all taking DNA tests through Ancestry. Yeah. So more and more people are getting into the database. Okay. There's more and more people in the database okay. in Australia. Okay. And eventually I figured out I had enough DNA matches and I was able to identify who I thought my grandparents were. Oh, okay. And so I researched them and I found out they had three sons. Okay one of which was significantly younger than the other two. Okay. So there was two brothers who I considered would have been too old. Okay. And they had a younger son who I thought was right in the sweet spot for the right age. Okay. And so I started researching him. Uh -huh. I found out where he came from. And that small country town has a Facebook page. Oh, nice. So I put a post on their Facebook page and said, I'm looking for family of these two people. Mm -hmm. And I got a message back from someone who said, yeah, I know them. Their daughter lives out on such and such a road with her son. Okay. So his daughter was still in town. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So that woman, as it turned out, was my aunt. Okay. Oh. And her son was my cousin. Okay. So I wrote him a letter. Okay. And gave him some of the circumstances. And one day he rang me. Okay. Well, he and his wife together, actually. Okay. And I had a conversation with them and I explained what I was up to and what was going on. Uh -huh. And they said to me, so who do you think your father is? And I told them and he said to me, yes, that sounds about right. Okay. So long story short, he did a DNA test and we were able to prove that we were first cousins. Okay. And so that identified my father. Okay. Who had passed away at the time. He had already passed. Okay. And was your mom right to be angry at him? Was he not a nice guy? Well, I don't know too much about him directly but as I have pieced together the picture subsequently he was married with two young children mm. was having a relationship with my 18 year old mother mm. when subsequent to my mother being pregnant he left town got divorced from his first wife remarried mm. moved to another town had a second family and the second family didn't know anything about his past. Oh, of any of it. Wow. Okay. Any of it. They didn't know he'd had children mm. from a first wife, let alone anything about oh, me. Oh, no kidding. So he just abandoned those first, well, the second and third child he had, right? He left town, got divorced, went somewhere else, got married again, had another family. Okay. So just start all over. It doesn't matter. Whatever. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Try again. Whoopsie. Oh, so Lordy. That doesn't paint. I mean, I don't know anything about him personally, but that doesn't paint him in a good light. No. And those two kids he had in the first marriage, are those the ones I get confused about all these family members? Have you connected with them? Yeah. I, well, one of them had already passed away, but okay. the other one I connected with, and we, we were quite close because we actually had something in common yeah. because he'd been deserted by yeah. his father as well. Yeah. He probably remembers it too. Wow. So we had something in common and we were developing a reasonably close relationship, uh -huh. but he passed away a few years ago, oh, quite young. So dang. that was disappointing. Very. So it's so hard when you are a late discovery adoptee in your fifties because- Everybody's older and it's not like when you discover it when you're in your 20s or whatever, you know, you still should probably get on it. But, you know, when you're later in your own life, that just eliminates a lot of people that you would have been able to have a relationship with. That must be really sad. I've, I've found it really hard to make relationships with people because there's so many years where we <laughs> have no common experience. We have nothing in common. Most of my birth family are what I will call from rural parts of uh, Australia. Uh -huh. 
I was adopted in Sydney, which okay. is a large urban city. Yeah, so the city mouse and, and the country mouse kind of situation. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, we, we don't have shared family experiences. Yeah. We yeah. don't have shared life experiences. Yeah, so the only thing you have in common is your DNA. So you meet for lunch and go, hey, I probably would never be friends with you. <laughs> Exactly. In any other context. Not but exactly in those words. We wouldn't yes. tell that, that. But yeah, it's like, well, how do you build something? And do you really want to? I mean, you had a full life. It takes a lot of work to build up these relationships. I bet you spend a lot of time just kind of phone calls and navigating and meeting up with people. Well, they weren't terribly receptive to, oh, that um, side wasn't. to having a relationship, except one of my sisters, I spent some time with initially, uh -huh. but there was friction between the various siblings in that family. Oh, anyway. they all fought with each other. Oh, gosh. So they had some internal ah, friction. So throw another sibling in there. That probably just stirred it all yeah. up. Oh, boy. Ah, oh, it's so complicated. And I had a relationship with one of my sisters for a year or so. Mm -hmm. But when I started delving into who my father might be, I think... Uh. She found that a bit confronting, mm. and so she more or less cut off contact with me Gosh. Uh, because I started digging effectively into her mother's history. Yeah, people don't want to deal with that. Yeah, she found that a bit confronting, I think. Yeah, and so, just like, I don't want to think about this. Close that door. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Are you, on the whole, are you glad you found out you were adopted, or do you wish you would not have ever known? That is a really good question. <laughs> um, I think I would have been quite happy if I never knew. Yeah. I mean, I had have a stable yeah. family with lots of cousins and people that I have relationships with. And I'm not sure that other than the fact that I know in inverted commas, the truth, yeah. I'm not sure that I actually gained anything by finding out. Yeah, you didn't all of a sudden get these wonderful relatives that just warmly embraced you and brought you into their family. Did you have any medical questions or anything that got answered? A few minor things, yeah. but not, not no, really. Nothing major. Um, nothing major. I, as far as I know, don't suffer from any terrible diseases or okay. anything like that. Mm -hmm. So not really. And do you recommend now that adoptive parents tell their kids? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. As early as possible. Yes. Before they even can remember it. It's what I always... Yeah, absolutely. As, as early as possible yeah. and to be as open as possible. Yeah. That's one of the things that really annoyed me. When I approached people in my family who knew, mm -hmm. some of them actually said to me, well, why do you want to know? Oh, um, yes. Ah. Just leave it alone. Ah. I, mean, I bet they wouldn't know, say that if it was their own DNA, <laughs> you know? Well, one of the things about the adoptee community is it's really us and them because yeah. people who have no experience of it or no understanding of it can't really comprehend the issues. Mm -hmm. A lot of people can't really comprehend the issues. It's it's like, why would you want to know? Yeah, they minimize, oh, you loved your parents. They did a good job. What are you stirring the pot well, for? Just relax. Well, I spoke to my mother's sister and, you know, uh, your mother loved you. You loved your mother. Mm -hmm. why, why would you want to know anything else? Yeah. And it, it takes putting yourself in someone else's shoes. If you knew there was someone else out there that birthed you, yeah, you would want to know who that was, you know, yeah, obviously. If, but if, if people were able to put themselves in your shoes and you say, well, wouldn't you want yeah, to know? Yeah. I find that difficult to do. Yeah. Yeah. And they're protecting whatever they might feel guilty that they never told you or they might be protecting your adoptive parents or whatever. But man, let's think about the adoptee that is just stuck in the middle well, of all this. And as you said, as you get older, that's a harder conversation to have. Yeah, it's gone on for so long. I discovered that one of the groomsmen at my wedding knew I'd been adopted. Oh my gosh. So, and your mother was going to take it to her grave, but dementia kind of uh, cheated her of that, right? If, if she had a heart attack and dropped dead, yeah. maybe I would never you know. You would have never known. And I bet people don't consider dementia when they're keeping these big secrets, because that takes away any filter you have, right? That's right. Yeah. She just said anything. Yeah, yeah. So, wow. So there's no way to keep secrets anymore, and especially not now that there's DNA. Forget it, you know. Well, DNA is a whole... Yeah, that's a whole different... DNA is a whole new ball game. Yeah. Now, you were a genealogist, which I always find fascinating, and so many adoptees are genealogists even before they find out they're adopted. So I think that's fascinating. But you did it the old-fashioned way, like with microfish and old books. Yeah, I was the O'Brien family genealogist. I had been 
tracing the O'Brien family tree for <sighs> nearly 10 years before I found out I was adopted. And I'd organised family reunions. Yeah. I actually had someone come from the States to a family reunion in Australia. Wow. And hindsight's a wonderful thing because when I was doing all that research, and again, I'd spoken to people in the family and no one, even when I was researching the family, said anything. They didn't say anything. And you were talking about births and deaths and marriages and Deaths nothing. and marriages oh. and history. And, oh, jeez. My mother at one point did say to me, you know, when you're doing all this, don't go and talk to Uncle so-and-so because oh. he won't want to talk to you about it. And I always thought that was really odd because mm. I was very close to that uncle. Hmm. In hindsight, I now know that he probably would have spilled the beans. Oh, oh my goodness. She's crafty, that one. So she told me to stay away from him and not go and ask him those <laughs> oh questions. My gosh. He lived in the family home that their family had lived in for 100 years. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Now, once you started looking for your family and you discovered DNA, it took a long time to figure it out. But now you are helping other adoptees. Because it's very complicated, I understand. Yeah, look, it's a foreign language at first, mm -hmm. um, but once you sort of get familiar with it, it's not that hard. I don't delve deeply into the complicated science of it as such, but with Ancestry DNA particularly, it's simplified down. And when you do your DNA test, you get a list of people that you match with, mm -hmm. that you share DNA with, and you can start to build patterns amongst the people that you share DNA with and you can work out patterns and mm -hmm. relationships. So having taken two and a half years to figure out my own uh -huh. situation and figure out who my birth father was, I started helping people who were in a similar situation mm -hmm. try and figure out who their families were. And I've had some success at that. Yeah. And are you a staff person or a volunteer? I know I do everything on a volunteer basis. Wow, that's incredible. I'm associated with that organisation, the Post Adoption Resource Centre mm -hmm. in New South Wales. I'm associated with them now. And if they have clients who need help with analysing their DNA, mm -hmm. they refer them to me. Wow, that's so uh, great. And I help them with their DNA research. I've done things for my local Family History Society. Nice. Um, a woman who lives around the corner from me turned out she was adopted. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> We'd known her for quite a few years and I didn't know she was adopted. Obviously, she didn't know I was adopted. Oh, my gosh. And I talked her into doing a DNA test and mm -hmm. it took me four years, but eventually I figured out who her family were and found who her father was. Wow. I bet that's such a welcome help because when adoptees find out, especially if they're late discovery like you, you were, You've got a lot to deal with just emotionally and just the impact of that. And then to try to learn a whole new language of this DNA genealogy stuff, that must take a large weight off of people to have you help them. And at the start, people with DNA too, sometimes you don't find out you're adopted until you do a DNA test. Yeah, sometimes that's how you find out, right? Are you familiar with the NPE term, not parent expected? Yeah, Different people attribute different words to NPE, but yes, not parent expected is the phrase I prefer to use. Yeah. So you learn, oops, that wasn't my dad, who I thought was my dad. Usually it's the dad. Well, what I've discovered is that I think you'll find in most families and most extended families, there are circumstances where people don't have the parent they expected mm -hmm. and DNA tests have really unraveled all of that. Yeah. I had a DNA match who was a second cousin. And I could tell by the relationships between all our DNA matches pretty much where he fitted into the family tree. Okay. And he had a family tree that was completely wrong. Oh, okay. And so I reached out to him and said, hi, oh, you know, I can see we're probably second cousins. And uh -huh. I said, I see you've got a family tree, but it doesn't look right. Uh -huh. And as it turned out, he was adopted too and didn't know. It. Oh. oh, no. And, and so... I didn't hear from him for quite a while. It took him a while to, oh my to get his head God. around that situation. And then eventually he came back to me and said, hey, yeah, we need to talk. So that's why his family tree looked all messed up because he was looking yeah, at yeah. the wrong family. Well, he didn't know he was adopted. Oh. He was in his 70s. No way. Oh, my gosh. Okay, people, quit doing this to people. Quit the secrets. This is so harmful. Yeah, it is. It's terrible. And they're all going to come out now. Yeah. Any young moms giving birth nowadays, there's just no way you can ever keep that a secret. But people my age and older, I think, 
there's still quite a few secrets there that are going to get found out because people give these for Christmas presents, the DNA tests. And and the sociologists have sort of advanced now too. And the current theory is that you do tell people and that you don't keep it a secret. But back in those days, it was all a secret. Yeah, there was so much shame involved. I attribute a lot of it to misogyny and just women felt like they did something wrong and have to hide and be ashamed of things. And uh, I hope that that tide is turning. For sure. Well, it's probably got to do with the Victorians because mm-hmm. if you do genealogy, two, three hundred years ago, mm-hmm. there was probably more sense of unwed mothers and mm-hmm. it wasn't so stigmatized uh-huh. probably a couple of hundred years uh-huh. ago. But then in the last hundred, two hundred years, it got really stigmatized. And then we seem to have gone back around the circle again. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so complicated don't forget a couple of hundred years ago you needed to know a woman could have children before you wanted to actually marry her oh is that just testing out testing out the equipment you needed to have children because you needed children to look after you in your old age for sure to run the farm or whatever oh my gosh yeah that's right so Uh, a couple of hundred years ago you needed to know that women could have children okay so yeah Uh, kick the tires a little bit make sure and we've gone all around the circle yeah now we're back at it now people don't need to get married to have children and gay people having children, all sorts of different things. So it's interesting, yeah. but I hope that it continues to have a sense of openness because certainly these secrets are just toxic and just complicate matters way more than they needed to be. Well, secrets are the worst because I wouldn't have thought any less of my adoptive parents if I'd found out yeah. when I was a lot younger. Yeah. I would have just had the opportunity to have relationships with biological family. Yeah. I grew up with one sister and I would have loved to have a brother. Oh, would that have been nice? Ugh. As it turned out, I had a couple of brothers. I've got one left, but we're mm. not really mm. in touch. Not really close. Yeah, sometimes uh, adoptive parents think it's going to take something away from you if you open it up. But I think it just is additive. Everybody gets more and there's room enough for all of us. That's right. Know? If people could see it as adding something rather than taking something away. There's no competition uh, here. And uh, we can be helpful if we want to be. <laughs> that would be nice. You know, oh, you want to find your birth mom? Let me help you. That would be good. Yeah. My birth mother was really grateful to my adoptive mother. I bet. Because she didn't have much choice in the matter. So she was glad that you got to a good family and had a wonderful childhood. Yeah, yeah. She was very happy and she was delighted by the fact that I was happy and well and healthy and looked after. Nice. And, and all those sort of things. So. I think if they could have met 20 years earlier, I think they would have had a positive reaction. Yeah, you know, maybe they would have been friends. Who knows? There's all sorts of ways people are building families and creating communities around themselves. So openness is a good thing. Is there anything else you'd like to say or mention that I didn't ask you about yet? I I always tell adoptive people that I work with when we do DNA work and we find birth families, I always just tell people to manage their expectations. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And you don't always get a Kodak moment. So yeah, adoptive people who are looking for Perth family always are hoping for a positive, yeah. uh, embracing sure. outcome. Yeah, And that's not always the case. So I always just tell people to manage their expectations. Yeah, it's probably not going to be the fantasy that you have in your mind. May not be. It might be. Might be better than you thought. But it might be really challenging. Well, I had a situation where a lady's father turned out to be in New Zealand, actually. Uh-huh. And when we made contact and he found out, he was delighted. He got on a plane the next day and oh, flew to Australia. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's amazing. So, so you get a good result, yeah. but not always. At Post Adoption Resource Centre, do they have adoption therapists that could help people with search and reunions? That's primarily what they do. Uh-huh. Okay. So they hand you the DNA piece of it. They primarily do counselling nice. and support yeah. and they provide third-party mediation services because yeah. in Australia now, the laws change in New South Wales anyway, so that you can get information about your birth mother mm-hmm. reasonably readily. Okay. And so they provide services to people who want to reach out to their birth families. They're like a third-party mediator. Nice. They provide counselling and they've only really started DNA because it's just become a thing. Sure. Yeah. It's so prominent now and such a great resource using that technology. Well, it sounds like they are very supportive of you and I'm sure you continue to draw support from them. And is it rewarding working with other adoptees and helping them along the path that you've already trod? 
Oh, yeah, that's why I do it yeah. because I've walked a mile in these shoes yeah. and I've been the person who's got that news and sat there with a DNA test and thought, what the hell do I do now? Yeah, so you can be there for that person. I think that's just beautiful. You know, you could have gone a bunch of different directions with your newfound knowledge. You could have just been angry and bitter or you could have just put it all away and closed the door again, but you opened it up, you found all the people that you could, and now you're helping other adoptees. I think that is very admirable. Well, it's very rewarding, especially when you get a good result. Yeah, when people find people that are happy to be found and that complete their family, that's very nice. I would say in more than 50% of the cases, the birth fathers don't even know they've had a child. Yeah, back in the day, they probably were never told and just went on with their life. Well, I knew one case where the birth mother found out she was pregnant and just moved into state and the birth father didn't even know what happened to her. She just disappeared. (gasps) Oh, Wow. As I later found out, she was the love of his life and she just disappeared. Oh my gosh. How hard. And when he found out he had a daughter, he was delighted. Okay. So that was another connection. Oh, but gosh, how many years had to go in between that? Oh, so heartbreaking. There's so many emotions, good, bad, all of it, all the gray in between. Gosh. Well, thank you for helping us understand all these complexities better. I think your story is really remarkable and beware. Dementia, people, (laughs) the secrets can come out. No filters when you've got dementia. Yep, no filter. And just as open as we can possibly be with everyone touched by adoption. Just try to be as open as possible. Well, very nice to meet you, Peter. I wish you all the best. Thanks, Beth. It's been delightful. Yeah. And is there a way people can get a hold of you if they'd like to talk to you? You have my email address. It's P for Peter, M for Michael, O for Oscar. So P M O. 2167. Okay. All right. I'll put that email in the notes. I'm sure people would love to talk. I'm happy to hear from any Australian adoptees, particularly if they want some help with their DNA. All right. Would American adoptees be welcome as well? (laughs) Oh, absolutely. But (laughs) But you can't really help them with their DNA. Well, I can. Americans are actually easier because there's a bigger database. Yeah, for sure. And I understand other countries are very small, like Asia. That's not a country, but the whole region is very low in the database. Yeah, they've got low testing numbers Mm -hmm. and it's actually illegal in France. Isn't that weird? I don't understand. I I don't know why, but it's illegal to do a DNA (laughs) test in France. That's so bizarre. So I don't know why, but I've collaborated with a few American genealogists on things that have touched in Australia. Yeah. Well, we had Julie Dixon Jackson on the show several episodes ago. She is actually from Australia. She's an American DNA expert. So if you haven't heard her episode, go ahead and find that one. I'll put that one in the show notes too. I can do that because I'll go back and have a look for that one. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good one. She's made it her whole career to be an investigator. It's pretty cool. All right. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Peter. And listeners, please share this episode with somebody you know that might be interested in hearing this wonderful story. And if you'd like to support the podcast, Well, that's one way you could share the episode. You can also support us by joining Patreon with a $5 a month or more donation. That helps me keep going with the software I need and it helps keep these episodes commercial free. And I want to give a big shout out to our newest Patreon member, Jenny Becknell. Thank you so much for your support and to all of my Patreon supporters. Thank you very, very much. And I do have an adoptive parents group. If anyone is an adoptive or foster parent, it's called Aptitude. And you can find more about it at our website, unravelingadoption.com. Well, thanks again, Peter, for joining me for this conversation. I wish you all the best. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. And Peter and I want you all to stay Stay safe. safe.